You're listening to Talking to Teens, where we speak with leading experts from a variety of disciplines about the art and science of parenting teenagers. I'm your host, Andy Earle. We're here today with David Allen. He is the author of the international bestseller, Getting Things Done, which Time Magazine called the definitive business self-help book of the decade. He has for decades been touring the world, consulting, speaking with business leaders about productivity and how to accomplish the things that really matter in life. And he has a new book, Getting Things Done for Teens. Take control of your life in a distracting world. So excited to talk to David about this book and about all of the work he's been doing specifically about how you can help teenagers to manage all of the stuff that's going on in their lives and to figure out what's really important, what their values are and what they want to stand for. All that and more coming up. David, thank you so much for making the time to be here. Delighted to be here, Andy. Thanks for the invitation. You have such a brand built in kind of this productivity and business market. And I think, you know, that it would be easy for you to write another book for business people, you know, uh, follow up kind of how to be more productive, but you don't do that. Instead, you write this book for kind of a different demographic, which is teenagers. And it's really well done. It's clearly was a ton of time and effort put into doing this. And I, I wonder what made you write this book for teenagers? Well, first of all, I have to give a shout out to my co-authors, Mike Williams and Mark Wallace. They really did the heavy lifting because I don't have kids. They do. And mm. you know, I developed the methodology, but for 30 years plus, you know, as I've been doing seminars and coaching with this stuff, people go, God, I wish I'd have learned this when I was 12. Yeah. Because once you, once you get this, you realize I could have learned this when I was 12 <laughs> and I didn't, and I didn't. You know, and I had to sort of fumble around as I threw myself into the fire hose of life out there, mm. you know, and try to figure all this stuff out. But it is learnable, it's trainable, it's teachable. And, you know, my two co authors have actually had a good bit of experience. Mike, as a senior manager at General Electric, uh, ran into my stuff, got all enthused with it, and then he said, Wow, I got to share this with my kids. And he did. He started <laughs> to blog about that. And then Mark, I, we ran across Mark, who's a public school teacher in Minneapolis. And he ran across this methodology for himself. He said, oh, my God, this changed my life. But how can I not share this with my 8, 9, 10, 12-year-olds that he was teaching in the in the public schools, in elementary school? So he started to frame this for kids. And the kids got it. And not only got it, they got it in an enthused way. And, it, you know, they're not like old, you know, cruds like you and me. <laughs> We've got a lot of habits we probably would need to change to implement this. They go, oh. That's how you do it. So, so anyway, so so Mike and Mark right. were, were, you know, they they sort of showed up because I tried to wonder over all these years, how do I reach this audience? Because if we wanted to change the world, we need to get it to kids. Sure, the next generation is the place to start. Yeah, and it, and it's global, and you know, if they get this from the beginning, oh my God, what a difference it could make! And I had already had, you know, uh, several people in my universe who had wound up you know, running across my stuff and my methodology, implementing it themselves, and then having kids and started to build that into how they, ah. you know, I, my, my CTO, as a matter of fact, my, my chief, you know, tech guy, you know, for many years, uh, homeschooled uh, his five daughters. Wow. And from the very beginning, his whole household was built around outcome and action and keep stuff out of your head and what's the next step and, you know, and using this methodology. And his kids just wrote their own tickets in terms of, you know, they were winning robotics competitions at age 12. Uh, they, were, uh -huh. they were running the tech <laughs> side of their college when they were freshmen <laughs> because they, they just knew how to, you know, they just said, oh, okay, so let's just go do this. So I yeah. saw how powerful this was when people started to implement to that world. You know, I, I'd been searching for a long time and wondering how on earth we could start to reach this audience because I didn't really know how to frame it myself, didn't have enough experience to be able to, you know, speak from any authority about that. But we said, you know, look, we've got to do this. So running across Mike and Mark and us collaborating, we said, I guess the time is here. And, uh, you know, let's go ahead and do this. The jury's still out. You know, we wrote this book basically for both teens as well as for caring adults. 
sure. not going to walk into a bookstore and pick up a book on productivity. You know, come on. You know, we'll see. <laughs> You know, but there are a whole lot of parents already that have already handed this to their kids. They're saying, "Oh my God, I just talked to somebody that's got two eighteen-year-old twin girls and a twenty-year-old," and you know, and he said, "I'm sending this to them because, you know, they're still in the midst of all of this right now." And this is not step-down language. This is a, an adult yeah. can read this and get adult information because we didn't step down the methodology. All we did was sort of frame it in a way where it might make more sense to somebody of the of a younger generation. Well, sure. And you updated, you know, instead of everything being put on paper, it's like, hey, there's great apps that you can use to, you know, make checklists and taking the idea of getting things out of your head. And you really adapted it for a digital age, you know, uh, and a digital generation. Well, not and just really digital, cool. but come on. You know, I've coached some of the best and brightest, most sophisticated executives you can imagine. And they still have to train themselves to empty their briefcase after that conference, you know, mm. take all the meeting notes from the boardroom, you know, and then throw that into their end basket and make decisions about what to do about it. It's just for a teen, they just need to empty their pack, <laughs> say, you know, so that the mom isn't discovering something three weeks later than she should have signed it to give back to them. Right. You know, but so there's no difference in the methodology. There's just a little bit of a different potential application, but even not that much difference. You know, come on, like, where, where are you accumulating stuff that you got to empty? I still have to do that, you know? Constantly, my inbox is, I don't even want to think about it right now, but it strikes me that this is, like, so important at this time because I talk to parenting experts all the time, David, and they all are so adamant about, you know, teens today are being overscheduled and overworked and, you know, way too much stuff. And, but then, so when I ask them, well, so what do we do? The answer is, you know, to not schedule our teens as much or not ask them to do as much stuff, right? To, I guess, you know, basically put them in a slower group. But I, I like your solution here, which is, well, maybe they just need some tools to organize all that stuff better and to turn it into something actionable and, and to not feel so overwhelmed by it. And basically, you know, build the external brain and keep that inventory complete, clear, and current. And then make good moment-to-moment -moment choices about what to do. So they have time to go do social media, you know, once they finish their homework. Uh, they have time to go do the fun things they want to do. And so it's not about slow down your life, not at all. That's a good way to sell it. No, come on. It, you know, we framed it in the in the preface there. It's like, look, are, are you ready? Are you ready for the prom? Are you ready to do college applications? Are you ready for the Halloween party? Are you ready for what? You know, don't wait till the last minute, and you could have made some decisions about this early on. And interestingly, you know, as we talk about it in the book, you know, at some point, parents feed their kids, and at some point, the kids have to feed themselves. At some point, the parents dress the kids. At some point, the kids have to dress themselves. So there's a whole progression along the developmental stage of, uh, you know, a young person that at different stages, they have to sure. take on more accountability, more responsibility to manage themselves and then build their own structures about how do they manage that. It's just, you know, there's right. a whole lot of given, you know, what you said and what's true is that the, the stress of opportunity out there and the stress of ubiquity, like constantly on, constant things, yeah. that bright baubles that can attract you, distract you. You know, that it becomes that much more important that you have a structure that you start to manage your life probably at a much earlier age than, you know, many of us thought we actually had to do that. Sure. It's like attention, I think, is becoming such a limited resource. There are so many things vying for our attention and the people who make these uh, marketers and apps are getting really good at getting our attention. So I think we have to be even better at shining the spotlight of our attention where it needs to be at the moment. Exactly. So your method, the getting things done for decades has been something that people turn to and talk about. And one of the, you know, most frequently cited productivity tools I think that I know of. So for people who aren't familiar and even for people who are given this new book that you have, what is the basics of GTD? Yeah. Well, basics, and I'll give you the 22nd version, is anything, That's what we anything that has your attention potentially. Wow, I've got the Halloween party coming up. I need to wonder who to ask to the prom. You know, my motorcycle needs something fixed on it. Anything that's got your attention, you can't finish the moment you think of it. You better capture that somewhere. 
That's stage one, step one. You need to capture it, get it out of your head, park it, park that placeholder somewhere in a place you trust. And then sooner than later, look at that again and then ask yourself, how do I clarify what I need to do about it, if anything? What's the next action? What do I need to do about this thing I need to do on my bike or my, or my cycle or my scooter? And what's the next step? So that's the clarify step. What's the next step? Is uh-huh. that a phone call to make? Is that a website to surf? Is that just stop by the shop and drop it off or something? What, what, what? What's next? Right. So there's the step two, which is clarify. Step three is organize. If you can't finish it in the moment, where do I put a reminder of that so I can see a reminder that that's something I've decided I need or might want to do, you know, when I'm in a context to do it. When I go out for errands, if I'm going out to tool around for the next two hours, what are the things I need to do, right? Well, I need to, you know, buy socks. I need to stop by and pick up a, a present for X, Y, and Z. And, oh, yeah, I need to drop by the the scooter shop and see, you know, whether I need to make an appointment or not. So then there's a, that's the organized step. I need to put a reminder somewhere that I'll see it like an errands list or something. And step four would be make sure when you go out, look at your errands list, reflect. You need to, wait a minute, let me look at this inventory of things I might need, would, could, should, ought to do. And then step five is then make some good conscious choice about what you do and what you don't do. So that it comes from a place of trust, not one of, gee, I hope this is what I need to do, or just simply making decisions by whatever the lightest and l- latest and loudest thing is banging around in your head. Ah, uh, right. Taking a little more control. So that's the essence of really a whole lot of the basics, the fundamentals, the blocking and tackling, if you will, of getting things done. So we capture the stuff, and then we clarify, which was figuring out kind of like the next actionable step to take. Which I I think is so important because it's a lot of times it's like we get overwhelmed by all the things like you're saying, like, oh, man, and now there's something wrong with the bike and the scooter. And now I got a promise coming up and I got to figure that out. And now the thing and and like you refer to them as open loops. Mm -hmm. It's like all these things, these items that are kind of unresolved. It's it's all the woulds, coulds, shoulds, need to, ought to, should, you know, yada, yada, yada. And and most people don't realize. Well, there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, God, what a great time to be alive that you have those all those options, right? As opposed yeah. to, you know, just feed yourself, you know, to stay alive. You know, sure, so, right. you know, these are first world problems. But the truth is, <laughs> yeah. they're still, they can still be very problematic and can create a whole lot of internal stress. And the stress for teenagers is certainly increasing, at least based upon the statistics we've seen. So, right. I mean, somebody can unlike you, you know, in your social media, and that can color your world gray. You know, their whole world. So the fact is, I mean, again, our first world problem, but there's still problems. There's still things you need to deal with and address or can and, you know, engage with them appropriately. So, yeah, you know, it's capture, clarify, organize, reflect, and engage, which are the five stages of how you get your kitchen under control. It's how you get your desk under control. It's how you get your homework under control. It's how you get anything under control, as well as your consciousness. So, you know, but kids can learn this. How young does a kid need to be to say, hey, what's your wild success idea about the party or for Halloween or Christmas? Great. Oh, you want a Christmas tree? Fabulous. Isn't that cool? What do, what do we need to do? We don't have a Christmas tree. What do you think is the next step? Uh, How young do you think somebody is that could actually answer that question? Try three. Try four. Yeah. Oh, find a place that has Christmas trees? Oh. Yeah. Or, yeah, I don't know. Well, how could we find out? Well, let's go look at that. Let's go see where they, you know, da 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 Google it? Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, though this was written essentially for teens and people who care about teens, there are a lot of preteens that we've already done some you know, early returns on this that they get it. And it's also... <laughs> <laughs> it's a Trojan horse. Parents who've read this and sort of wanted to hand it to their kids go, God, I need to read this and do this first before I give it to my kids. Because it, sure, it's, yeah. it's, it's reminding them about their own best practice behaviors. And, you know, if you want to model it for your kids, you know, you better. You know, I think that a lot of parenting is disguised self-development. And it's this phase <laughs> of life. Where we have well to kind said. of like re relearn everything so that we can be really good at it, so we can teach it to our our kids. Well, you don't learn anything till you teach it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So so, but that's that's fabulous. And the good news about that is, hey, you got something you want your kids to know. I remember this. I don't know if it's a myth, but it's a it's a common story about Gandhi. You know, some parent brought her kid to Gandhi in India and said, "Wow, this kid is eating too much sugar. Please tell him to stop eating sugar." <laughs> and God, he didn't say anything. He said, come back in two weeks. 
So she came back in two weeks, and he said, you know, it's not a good idea to eat sugar. You should probably stop. And she said, why, did you, why didn't you tell him that two weeks ago? He said, I was eating sugar. <laughs> good story. So one of the best ways to train your kids with these methodologies is to demonstrate it, model it, do it yourself, and then have a way to translate it. I think that's what we did in the book, was give parents or, or teachers or counselors or clergy, whoever you know, might be reading this, who might be interested in educating and communicating best practices to kids, you know, a way to translate these best practices into you know, things that are meaningful to them. Yeah, there's a vocabulary to talk about all of this. You've created kind of this framework. And it strikes me that it goes deeper than simply, you know, organization, because after you get through kind of the five steps, there's a whole second part of the book where you get into kind of these different levels of goals that you can have or kind of like areas of focus for your life. And the bottom is like just the actions and projects and kind of the stuff that you're working on. But as you move up the pyramid a little bit towards the top, you see, you know, your area of focus, your goals, your vision, and then at the very top is your purpose. And it strikes me that it's like, you know, yeah, well, once you kind of start capturing all the stuff uh, and clarifying it and organizing it, then, at, you know, at a certain point, you have to start making decisions about, well, I got too much stuff that I can't really maybe do all of it. So what? Do I need to prioritize or what do I want to spend my time on? Well, not only that, Andy, but the, you know, come on, a lot of parents right now are worried about how much time kids are getting sucked into social media, you know, Facebook, yeah. WhatsApp, and all that other stuff. And they say, well, David, what's the solution to that? And I say, how excited are your kids about learning to ride a horse or program software or being a pilot? And how's the summer yeah. going? by the way, and what, what could they learn to do? See, right. they're not going to get away from all that stuff unless there's something else more exciting. Sure. Right? And what else would be more exciting? Well, that's where the horizons might come in. Hey, what do you want to do with your life? How cool could it be? What do you want to do? Well, why are you spending two hours you know, on Facebook when you could be surfing you know, cool places to learn how to ride horses or ways to, you know, online courses you could be taking to learn how to write code so you can make a gazillion dollars in Silicon Valley. You know, come on. <laughs> you know, the, uh, how many things? So, you, you know, it's like you're not going to you're not gonna stop somebody from doing stuff by telling them not to do it, right? Yeah. You just need to redirect. You attract them towards something else. It's not about discipline. It's about direction. How do I want to direct my consciousness? You know, where do I want to direct it? So a lot of the, the high horizon stuff, you know, it sounds pretty sophisticated, but hey, it doesn't have to go any further than, hey, kids, what, you know, what really kind of floats your boat? You know, a year from now, what would you like to be doing? What would you like to know how to do? You know, how important is that to you? And then coach people towards some of those kind of horizons and then bring those down to projects and next action. So they, they're not just sitting there twiddling their thumbs and saying, yeah, that's a nice idea, but I don't know how to get there. Well, great. What's the next step? So what we did was, and what this methodology does, it ties sort of the execution of stuff. Like how do you actually get things done? And I'm sorry, but that's the title of the book. The way you get things done is that's what does right done there. what does done mean? Wow, I know how to ride a horse. What does doing look like? Oh, uh, gee, I need to call my aunt Susie because I think she rides horses, and let me ask her how what she suggests I ought to do. Right, that's all you need to do. And it's really not so much about working any harder; it's about getting appropriately engaged with your commitments. And your life, an appropriate engagement doesn't mean you need to finish these things. It just needs to be you, you need to be in the driver's seat about how you're engaging with them. So I like that. So these are all kind of conversations that you could have with a teenager to help them kind of clarify what their purpose and their vision is. These kind of higher levels on the pyramid. Exactly. And not as a forced thing to do. And I think we tried to write it. I don't know. You could tell me anyway, whether it worked or not. We tried to write this. So this is not a like, ooh, this is a you have to manual and you have to go do all this stuff. This is like, hey, test some of these things out. Try them out. Here's a, here's a thing you yeah. might want to just experiment with and see if it rings your bell. It definitely comes across because you guys even do something which I, as a researcher, think is really cool that you actually invite people to try it out. Uh, you know, hey, try it, try it for a week doing it this way and try it for a week doing it that way and then do whichever one feels better to you or works better in your life. I like that approach and I think that more people need to do that. And I think especially during the, you know, teenage years and early 20s, it's like a time of life for experimentation because you're asking your teenager, well, what would you like to be doing in a year? They definitely need a lot of experiences to be able to 
make those kinds of decisions. I, I guess a lot of times teenagers can be pretty, you know, oh, I don't know, whatever, uh, you know. So when you're trying to ask them, like, oh, well, what, what are you, what would you like to be doing in a year? I don't know, you know, whatever. I like just kind of, st- uh, like, you know, what, like, what if they're kind of not really giving you much to work with, or kind of really short answers, or kind of like little shrug of the shoulder kind of things like that? Would you say it's just kind of maybe not a good time to uh, have this talk, and you should circle back later, or is there kind of something that you could do to get them to think about it more? What would you do with a kid who goes, I don't know. I just look at what they're doing and ask <laughs> mm. them why they're doing that. Yeah, what do you like? What turns them on about that? Sure. What if you could do that full time? What if you could do that your whole life? You didn't have to do anything else, and you had a lot of money to be able to go play and do other things you want to do. <laughs> how cool would that be? Well, how do you think you're going to get there? And here's some options, you know. So come on, you know, how many kids have you know wound up, you know, buying their parents, you know, the mansion? Because the kid just went, you know, screw you. I'm going to go do what I feel like doing and made a gazillion dollars. Yeah. You know, so who's to say, especially these days because of, the, you know, how interesting and strange the world is about how many things people can find to do that are potentially valuable. Yeah, that you might not even know exist right now. Oh, come on. You know, I grew up in Freeport, Louisiana, and, you know, in the, in the 50s and early 60s, and, it, you know, if you had any intelligence at all, there, the, the options about things to do were about five. You know? mm. <laughs> That's all. I, you know, consultant, what's that? I didn't know how to spell it. You know, uh, yeah, uh, right. Uh, actor, well, maybe, but only other people could do that. How about graphic designer? What? What are you, talk- <laughs> what are you talking about? You know, so, you know, so it, it is, it is, again, a great time to be alive. If you're willing to sort of take a positive step forward and, and start to explore that and start to explore what are all the possibilities and options and what kind of rings my bell right now. And, you know, you're going to change your mind anyway. Once you get started, you just need to get started. So, I, you know, so if somebody yeah, is like going, Duh, I don't care. Do you know? I just find what is it that would get them started on anything? You know, they, they're playing video games. Design a video game. Yeah, totally. So if you found Anything in this interview helpful, go ahead and check out uh, gtd4teens.com. It's a website where David and his colleagues have created all kinds of helpful resources that go along with this book and podcasts and articles and stuff where he provides additional resources and breaks down some of the topics from the book. That's gtd4teens.com. We're here with David Allen talking about his new book, Getting Things Done for Teens. And we're not done yet. Here's a look at what's coming up in the second half of the show. How many of the books you've bought have you actually read? (laughs) And people complain about that or feel guilty about it. I go, no, you just added to your library. Look at how many cool options you've got in your library. You only read one at a time anyway. So everything is someday maybe actually. A whole lot of the social media and what kids are doing on their smartphones is they're actually engaging in a very social, engaged world out there. You know, there's nothing wrong with that, you know, at all, as long as you're learning from that and you're not letting that distract you from something you would really more like to be doing or need to be doing given, you know, what you're about in your life. You know, come on, Andy, I'm, I'm 72. If I go back to the 50s when I had, I was totally enthralled and totally in love with my girlfriend at age 15 and I spent two hours on the phone with her, what's the difference? <laughs> you know, how, was, how productive was that? Well, how much did I want to have to think about? Is that really something I should be doing? Oh, come on. You know, I just couldn't help it. It was like, of course. Sure. Right. And, yeah, and yeah. I even, you know, not a lot, but I still would distract myself by picking up a phone book and flipping through the yellow pages. I thought that was kind of fun. Well, there's no difference between the, the old yellow pages in a phone book. No different than what the web is right now. Ex- well, except the, the you know, it's cataclysmic difference in terms of just volume and access. But it's still the same function. Sure. The average 18-year-old spends like over six hours a day on their smartphone, according to you know the latest statistics. That's a lot of time. Hey. You know, why isn't it nine or ten? And what's wrong with, you know, hey, you need to spend more time on that, <laughs> given where you're going and what you really want to be doing. Say, so, hey, what are the things you might like to accomplish over the next summer, next three weeks, next three years or whatever? Fabulous. Let me make a list. How often do you think I ought to remind you about these and let the, and let the kid tell you? Right, right, yeah. 
Want to hear the full interview? Sign up for a subscription today. You get unlimited access to all the interviews I've conducted. It's completely affordable, and your subscription helps support the work we do here at Talking to Teens. Thanks for listening. I'll see you next time.